Well, good afternoon. Welcome to Gettysburg National Military Park. My name is Jim Flook. I'm one of the seasonal rangers here at the battlefield, and so I have the uh, privilege of giving these programs uh, over the summer months. And this afternoon, we're going to be talking about Cemetery Hill. A young man who is surveying these fields just after the battle and will be a part of placing the Soldiers National Cemetery right here. David Wills is going to call this the most important point on the field. He is not alone in that estimation. Commanders on both sides will identify this as the key terrain. Cemetery Hill is going to see direct fighting only on July 2nd, the night of July 2nd, 1863. But it is a very important part of this story, July 1st, July 2nd, and July 3rd. We'll start out with the story of July 1st, if everybody will turn around for me, take a look at this monument right here. Anybody recognize that fellow? That is Reynolds, Major General John Fulton Reynolds. Reynolds is the commander of the Union First Corps Infantry. They're going to be the first infantry soldiers to reach this battlefield. And Reynolds is going to be the second out of four commanders to make an incredibly crucial decision for the Union Army on the afternoon, or on morning and afternoon, of July 1st, 1863. Now that first commander is going to be the commander of the cavalry, General John Buford. General Buford, when he reaches Gettysburg on the night of June 30th, rides through this area and he determines that this point that we're standing on, Cemetery Hill, is the key terrain feature. So he will take his horse soldiers and push them north and west out to the ridge lines so that he can defend this place. He wants to give the Union infantry time to get here. It is called Cemetery Hill in 1863 because of the town cemetery. If you look behind you and to your right, that is the Evergreen Cemetery established by the town of Gettysburg in 1854. Otherwise, this is a bald hill. The soldiers who would fight here say that it stuck out like a sore thumb. You ever uh, hit your thumb with a hammer? No? You're careful in, in your uh, hammering work. Anybody else ever hit your thumb with a hammer? Yep. It's one of those things we, most of us do anytime we use a hammer. What happens? It hurts. <laughs> it hurts? Swells. Poofs or swells up. That's the analogy that the soldiers here use to describe this area of the battlefield. As we visit today and as we look around us, we see a lot of trees. But in 1863, almost all of these trees are not yet planted. This is what makes it a commanding position. And there are two other things that are going to be very important that are right next to this hill. One of them is right here. It's called the Baltimore Pike. Does anybody know where the Baltimore Pike leads? Hint, it's a trick question. I think I heard it over here. Washington, D.C. If you stay on this Baltimore Pike, it becomes Georgia Avenue in Washington, D.C. Now, it is also called Baltimore Pike because it could take you to Baltimore. But when we think about the Union Army, the importance of this road is that it leads you to Washington, D.C. That's the nation's capital. In other words, this is the communications line of the Union Army. They want to have that protected at all times. How many people walked in the cemetery from the other gates today? Okay, those other gates are along Tawny Town Road. Does anybody know where the Tawny Town Road goes to in addition to Tawny Town, Maryland? This one's harder. No. Nope. Those are both north. We want to think south. <laughs> Good guess, right? Think of home. No, it's going to take you to a place called Westminster, Maryland. And the important thing about Westminster, Maryland, 
This is where the supplies of the Union Army are located. So this hill, in addition to being key terrain, controls very two important roads. Roads which lead toward the nation's capital, roads which leads towards the supplies of the Union Army. So General Buford has decided this is a key point, pushes north, pushes west. When General Reynolds comes onto the battlefield at about 10 a.m. that day, he makes the same decision, and so he puts the infantry out west of town. As Reynolds is sending soldiers directly into the fight, he is going to be hit. He will be killed on this battlefield, perhaps within an hour of arriving. And so he has passed from command. That command is going to devolve. It's going to go down to Major General Oliver Otis Howard. General Howard is going to bring up the 11th Corps of the Union Army. Howard now has an important decision to make. Does he want to stay here and fight? Does he want to move elsewhere? You follow me, we're going to cross over the Baltimore Pike. We're going to talk about General Howard's decision, his leadership here on the afternoon of July 1st, and also what the Confederate Army thinks of this position. Now let's start out with what this place looked like. So you got a picture of Cemetery Hill that is taken just a few days after the battle. And I'm going to pass this around for everyone. That way you don't have to squint too hard here. A couple of things that you will notice. You will note the rock walls, which we can see still today. And you also get a pretty good idea that it's almost barren. We have only one tree. This photograph is taken probably from the vicinity of the gatehouse. As we look to the right, that's the second and larger brick building. And so perhaps one of those trees that we see along the wall there was here. We get an idea that it's pretty open. Now we have had some changes to the landscape. We are not at the north end of the hill as the North End existed in 1863. There would be another field behind you, and then there would be a rock wall on the opposite side of this parking lot. So the way that we see this distance from rock wall to rock wall, imagine that once more behind you. Major General Oliver Otis Howard has an equestrian monument just behind me here. He is the commander of the 11th Army Corps. He is now in command of the Union soldiers. There are now 17,000 soldiers here at the Battle of Gettysburg for the Union Army. There are 27,000 soldiers here for the Confederate Army. If you had a choice, would you generally prefer to have 17,000 soldiers or 27,000? 27. 27. 27. Quick response. He wants to have more soldiers. Not only does the Confederate Army have more soldiers, but they keep finding the end of the Union line. By 4 o'clock, they are going to cause those 17,000 Union soldiers to move into a full retreat. This retreat is going to be taking place through the town of Gettysburg. Now, you may have noticed that when we crossed the street, as we walked through the grass, we started to string out just a little bit, right? This is what happens to large groups of people. They don't stay in a tight, compact formation. The same thing is happening to soldiers. Soldiers are used to fighting shoulder to shoulder in long lines, two ranks deep. But they cannot do this through a town. So the Union soldiers are breaking down into groups. They're trying to rush. They're trying to get back to this point, Cemetery Hill, which has now become a rally point. Here to superintend that, to meet them, is going to be General Howard. He says, after an examination of the general features of the country, I came to the conclusion that the only tenable position for my limited force was the ridge to the southeast of Gettysburg, now so well known as Cemetery Hill. 
Even though he's identified it, he's going to have to be able to defend it. He has thousands of soldiers streaming backward. He has to reorganize them, get them ready to fight again. He spies a young sergeant with the colors moving toward the rear. Grabs this sergeant. Sergeant, plant your colors at the wall. Remember, there's one more wall, so he's not talking about right here, about another 50 yards to our north. Now it appears that this young sergeant does not recognize the Major General. He responds to him by saying, only if you go with me. So this Major General knows that he has to display personal leadership. These men have been beaten, they're falling back, they have lost their sense of teamwork, their ability to fight as a unit. So instead of reminding that sergeant that he is a Major General, who gives orders out to almost everyone, he instead takes the flag. And with that sergeant, he goes and he places the flag with the sergeant to encourage the men in that unit to rally. He is hoping that he can hold this hill. Around that time in the afternoon, Major General Winfield Scott Hancock is going to ride. General Hancock has that next equestrian statue over. General Hancock is the commander of the Union 2nd Corps. He is sent here by General Meade. He's Meade's personal representative and he's going to take command of the field. Hancock decides that in order to get up to speed, he's going to ride in an ambulance. So he's riding in an ambulance, banging down the roads, he's pulling out maps, he's trying to learn everything he can about the terrain. He becomes impatient, stops the hospital wagon, mounts up, rides to Gettysburg. First thing he's going to do, he's going to meet with General Howard. Hancock is going to be our fourth and final Union commander to make that all-important decision that this is the key point on the field. And so he and Howard are going to begin working together. Howard is going to keep placing his soldiers on this side of the Baltimore Pike on Cemetery Hill. Hancock is going to work further to the left as he brings in elements of the Union 2nd Corps. They're preparing in case there is a Confederate attack. Well, I had mentioned earlier that 27,000 Confederate soldiers come onto the battlefield on July 1st. They have the superior numbers. Uh, that doesn't mean that everything goes perfectly well. The Confederate Army is going to have its own challenges in leadership and in coordination. One of the most important is going to take place in the evening. At about 5 p.m., an order comes to Major General Richard Stoddart Ewell. General Ewell is in command of the 2nd Army Corps. The order tells him to take Cemetery Hill if practicable, but do not bring on a general engagement. How many of you find that clear as mud? <laughs> All right, let's break it down because there are two very important pieces. Let's start with the easy piece. Do not bring on a general engagement. Lee is communicating to Ewell something that Ewell already knows. Do not bring on a general engagement means make sure that Lee still has options. If the attack is made, the two enemies should not be in such close quarters that they have to keep fighting the next day. Lee is telling Ewell, make sure I have a full range of options. Attack, defend, maneuver. So he's keeping his options open. Lee always believes as much as possible in trying to seize the initiative. He wants to be acting, not responding. The more challenging part of that order is take Cemetery Hill if practicable. I want to give you another story of the command experience Ewell has had this day. This is his first significant battle as a lieutenant general in command of 20,000 soldiers. Now, earlier on July 1st, he's going to receive an order telling him to concentrate in the Gettysburg Cashtown vicinity. Anybody been to Cashtown? No, it's about 14 miles out to the west. So they're near on a map 
but not exactly the same point. When Ewell receives this order, he's going to make one of these, I like to call them the under the breath remarks, sort of those first response thoughts that we hope others don't hear and we really hope they don't write down. And I can tell by smiles that some people identify with this. The others who aren't smiling, I'm going to guess you identify as well, but don't wish to share. <laughs> On getting this order to go to two different places 14 miles apart, you will say, why can't a commanding general have someone on his staff who can write an intelligible order? That was in the morning. Now he is going to get this order that says to take Cemetery Hill if practicable. Let's see if we can take a different approach to how we might think of this. What I want to do is ask everybody to think about a 1 to 10 scale. So on a scale of 1 to 10, if you are Yule, what is the importance of Cemetery Hill based on the language of the order? So again, the language of that order, do not take cemetery or take cemetery hill if practicable, but do not bring on a general engagement. So one, Lee has no concern about taking cemetery hill. Ten, Lee absolutely has to have cemetery hill. So if you're Yule, thinking about this order, take cemetery hill if practicable, but do not bring on a general engagement. Where do you think that falls on a one to ten scale? Okay, we got a five. Uh, seven. 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 Not one end or the other, somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the middle. A three. A three. Five. Five. Three. 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 Six. 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 Five. 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 Let's say four. Four. <laughs> Five. Five. What do you think? Six. Four. Five. Five and a half. <laughs> okay, getting very detailed. Five? Five? Three? Pi, 3.14. 3.14. Well, now that's not quite pi, right? Because pi goes out for so many characters. It is, but I didn't want to go, I didn't want to take up everybody's time. Good call. All right, what do you think? Scale one to ten. Three? Six? Five? Three or four. Three or four. Okay. So, I think we've illustrated something very well. This is not perfectly clear. It is not obvious. We had, I think we had as low as a one. I think we had as high as a seven. We had a lot of fives. Good number of threes there as well. The decision that has been given to General Ewell is challenging. So let's try to add in the variables that General Ewell is facing. He has three divisions. One of his divisions is not going to reach Gettysburg before the end of the day. At 5 p.m., he is working with three hours of daylight left. It'll be pitch black by 8 p.m. In addition to this, he hears rumors that there are Union forces approaching on his left. His two divisions that are present, one of them is a little bit disorganized because of fighting through the town. They have to be reorganized to conduct an attack. The other division is disorganized from a bad fighting experience. That is to say that division did not fight together, but it fought by piecemeal. Ewell begins to talk to these two junior commanders. They tell them they think they can attack if they have reinforcements. So Ewell writes to Lee. A message comes back from General Lee. There are no reinforcements. No support is coming. So Ewell's been told by his two commanders that they think they can only make the attack with support. And his boss tells him there is no support. He's got this rumor of Union soldiers approaching. And he does not know where the entire Union army is at. He can likely determine that the 1st and 11th Corps have been here based upon prisoners. But he's not going to know for certain. He knows that there are some 40 pieces of artillery on this hill and the remnants of the Union Army. The number is close to 10,000. What happens to somebody when they are boxed into a corner? 
fight? How hard? Harder. They fight as hard as possible. That could be the mentality in the Union Army. So if Ewell is going to make an attack, he wants to make it a full-scale attack. Ewell is going to put all these things together, and he is going to make the decision that it is not practicable to attack. So there will be no fighting here on the night of July 1st, 1863. But both armies have identified it as a key point on the battlefield. Both armies want to control this point on day two. If you'll follow me, we're going to move up by the artillery to talk about Union plans to control this position and learn about how the Confederate forces will attempt to take this key point on the battlefield. We're very fortunate to have the physical terrain of the Battle of Gettysburg because that is one of the things that enables us to understand the experience of the soldiers. And so that's why as you walk around Cemetery Hill especially, you're going to see some of these signs up. These lunettes are a part of the resources that we want to try to protect. So as we maneuver our group, we're going to walk between and we're going to walk around the lunettes. We don't want to walk over any of them. The lunettes would have been dug by the artillerists as a way of protecting their position from any incoming artillery fire. And then artillery is going to be a key point of this story. On the morning of July 2nd, the Colonel of the 11th Corps Artillery, Colonel Wainwright, is going to come up to Captain Ricketts. Captain Ricketts' battery has four guns in this location. So if you turn behind you by the big tree, you're going to see a rock wall. Captain Ricketts tells us he has four guns on this side of the rock wall, and his monument is that large monument off to the right where we can see the letters F and G. That's for the combined batteries. Four guns on this side, and then two guns on the north side of the wall. Ricketts is tell, told by his commander, Captain, this is the key point of our position on Cemetery Hill and must be held in case you are charged here. You will not limber up under any circumstances, but fight your battery as long as you can. So as you listen to that order, what has Ricketts just been told? What's that? Die. Die here if necessary. You will hold this position. It is a very important position. Now, there's also going to be some concern. Many of these artillerists are worried about the infantrymen. The infantrymen of the 11th Corps were unfortunately called the Flying Dutch. Now, they are not Dutch. The word Dutch should instead be Deutsch for German. One out of four soldiers in the Union Army is born outside of the United States. The United States is not necessarily very welcoming of others. And there's a lot of hostility towards these foreigners in the 11th Corps. They had the unfortunate reality to be in a position where they got flanked at Chancellorsville, and they had an unfortunate reality of being in a position where they are flanked here on July 1st. So part of what Colonel Wainwright is telling to Captain Ricketts, you may be on your own, and the artillery has to hold. All right, let's look out to your left. Let's begin to take a look at this terrain. So as you are looking to the east, what do you see? Fields. All right, we have a clear view for a good distance. What else? It's downhill. We have the commanding position. What else? What other things do we see in the terrain? Maybe obstacles you'd have to cross over. Okay, different colors of grass. And if something is very green, what does that tell us? Water. Okay, so parts of that may be 
marshy or harder to pass. We've got some fence lines. Uh, we've got more stone walls. The road that you see there is not there in 1863, but it's still very difficult terrain. This is a commanding position. And off to your right, so directly behind me and behind those trees, we have another knoll. There's a monument there for the 5th Main Artillery, Stevens Battery. As we move a little bit, we'll see Stevens Battery more clearly. So Stevens Battery can shoot from south to north, while the guns here shoot from west to east. There are going to be some delays in the Confederate side with the planning of July 2nd. So the artillerists who are here are going to pull out some devices a pendulum hoss, and a French ordnance glass. And what they're going to do, they're going to take the morning and the afternoon, they're just going to start firing test shots. And they're going to record where everything falls. In other words, by the afternoon, this area has been turned into a killing field. And if anything tries to cross this ground, somebody along this line wearing a blue uniform will know exactly what type of shot, how long of a fuse to make sure that something is hit at any point in our field of vision. It becomes a very dangerous zone to cross. So the Union artillerists are prepared they are prepared by marking the field. They have been prepared to fight here to the death, if necessary, from that order. What are the Confederate soldiers doing this morning? If you'll follow me, we're going to move down the hill. I'm going to talk a little bit about the planning in the Confederate Army and then the attack the Confederate soldiers will make that evening. Wouldn't there be craters in the ground from the cannonballs? Are there going to be craters in the ground from the cannonballs? <laughs> there can be but we don't necessarily know how large. So you do have something that may be about eight to 12 pounds. And so yeah, that can make a dent. Now it is not a detonation device. So it is not going to explode on contact. Uh, it has a paper fuse. When that fuse runs out, it explodes. Now if the artillerists do their job correctly, it should explode in the air. If something explodes on the ground, the artillerists have not done their job. And there's no detonation device. So I, it's a great question to ask. I don't know any incidences of a soldier saying that I ran into a crater from an artillery piece. Yeah? So on that same theory, so the object of my cannon was really to just blow shrapnel through the area? Is that what they, if the cannonball's supposed to blow up in the air? Right. I just really want to shoot metal all through the air. Yes. Gotcha. How many people have been in a hailstorm? Okay, what happens to you when you duck? You still get hit, right? <laughs> this is what the artillery is trying to do. They're trying to create a hail of death. So a shell should explode 30 feet above and in front, and that'll produce large chunks. A case shot is filled with little bits of metal and powder. Bigger explosion. Uh, that is where the term shrapnel, that's going to be the closest association. Uh, canister. Is going to be golf ball sized pieces of metal. That's a short range, 400 yards or less weapon. So yeah, it's exactly about producing a large field of metal that moves. And that's how you hit a mass of moving soldiers. Now, of course, if you are planning from the opposite side, the Confederate attack, you want to be able to avoid all of that. Confederate intelligence is going to gather information very early in the morning, report back, and the orders are going to go out at about 9 a.m. The key plan calls for 14,000 Confederate soldiers to move south behind the Confederate line and then to approach the Union line by coming from south to north. This is Longstreet's Corps. It will result in the fighting that takes place at Little Round Top, Devil's Den, Peach Orchard, and Wheatfield. Now when those soldiers begin, the artillery on this end of the Confederate line, so this is the Confederate left or north end of the line, they are to make a demonstration. 
Demonstration is a fancy term for making a lot of noise with your artillery. It is not necessarily an attack, but it can be converted into one. So the idea is Confederate artillery will make a demonstration and then when possible, convert that into a full scale assault on both Cemetery Hill here and Culp's Hill to your right front. You'll notice that Culp's Hill is significantly different from where we stand on Cemetery Hill. It is fully wooded. So there are going to be a couple of challenging attacks. There are delays in the Confederate plans and that means that the soldiers who are to make the movement don't begin until 1 p.m. They reach their spot, they don't begin the attack until 4 p.m. So all that time up to 4 p.m., Confederate soldiers in this area can hear. They can hear axes, plates, cups being used to move dirt and terrain on Culp's Hill. They can hear as these guns fire their test shots to figure out how to hit them were they to attack. Major Goldsboro, 1st North Carolina, gives us an account of how challenging this is to the Confederate soldier. Perhaps nothing in battle is so trying to an infantryman's nerves as the patience of the preliminary artillery fire. So all they can do is wait. Finally at 4 p.m. when that Confederate attack begins, the artillery here to the north of the battlefield will respond as well. But Benner's Hill and other Confederate artillery positions are lower in elevation. Those guns may angle as far as 10 degrees. They don't shoot up very well. They shoot out in this low parabolic curve. The Confederate artillery at Benner's Hill and the other points is very quickly defeated. Almost all of it rendered combat ineffective. So very quickly, Confederate leadership discovers the consequences of what the Union artillery has been doing in preparation. No attack will go forward under daylight. They cannot send infantry soldiers across these fields in daylight. They are going to wait for cover of darkness. So I have a pair of maps here to share with you. And so what I'll have you do is point the top of the map or north towards your left. We are located right here along what was then called Brickyard Lane. Uh, today this is Weinburner Run here and we are in this position with the Union soldiers. Confederate soldiers would be to our left and well out of view. Notice that they are going to sweep and make a sweeping attack here on Cemetery Hill. Culp's Hill would be nearby. Stevens Battery, which is off to your right. And then you see all the different guns, which are back up here at the top of the hill. Reverse side, we've got a detailed map of the artillery position and a little bit sort of a finer detail of the attack here on Cemetery Hill. And this attack is not going to go forward until under cover of darkness. So darkness I mentioned before is at 8 p.m. Now, finally, Confederate soldiers will have the ability to go forward. 2,100 Confederate soldiers will be on the attack. No artillery support. The artillery has been defeated. It is also nighttime. And this is going to be a very rare instance of Civil War nighttime fighting. In defense, there are about 1,200 Union soldiers along this line and about 30 guns at the top of the hill who can point out toward the east. Now we do have to note a challenge for these artillerists as well. At some point, Confederate soldiers are going to get so close to the curvature of the hill that those shots would fly over them. So at some point when they get close enough, they will have a respite from these guns on the hill. Union artillerists, knowing that possibility, have placed the battery over on Stevens Knoll because it is off to the side. Stevens Knoll, the guns there, will always have this space in their view. 
The moment the line made its appearance on the top of the hill, 18 pieces of artillery and 3,000 infantry opened on them. But old Harry shouted forward, and on we went over fences, ditches, through marshy fields, and we fotched up at a stone fence behind which Mr. Yank had posted himself and did not want to leave. This is an account of one of the Confederate soldiers in the 8th Louisiana. Now he's going to tell us 18 pieces of artillery and 3,000 infantry. He wasn't correct. It's more about 30 pieces of artillery and only 1,200 infantry soldiers. But it is still a challenge. So even though Confederate soldiers are moving at night, these guns are still firing. The only source of light is going to be that flash of the muzzle, either from the artillery or from the rifle. Imagine that you are in these long lines shoulder to shoulder, and you're trying to move across that terrain at darkness. Some points you will be in view of artillery. You will have stuff flying in. At other points, as you drop down in elevation, you have a little bit of cover. So it's going to be a tremendous task that these Confederate soldiers have been called upon to undertake. Our soldier in the 8th Louisiana tells us that as they come up to this stone wall and fence, they won't stop there. But with bayonets and clubbed guns, we drove them back. By this time it was dark and we couldn't tell whether we were shooting our own men or not. Sergeant Oscar Ladley, one of the Ohio boys in defense, they came on us at dark, yelling like demons with fixed bayonets. We opened on them, but still they came, their officers and colors in advance. We lay behind a stone wall and received them with our bayonets. As these soldiers talk about bayonets, we know that it is close quarter, hand-to-hand -hand combat. Confederate soldiers know that they need to take this hill. Union soldiers know that they need to hold this hill. Major James Beale, out of the North Carolinians. The ground we had to pass over was ascending, but the troops advanced in double quick time, and with the cheer over the rifle pit in advance of the enemy's main line of breastworks, the ground was strewn with dead and wounded. So they know that in addition to making this attack, they're seeing family members fall, friends fall, yet they have to continue on. Lieutenant Whittier with the 5th Main Battery over to your right on Stevens Knoll. In a moment, the whole battery was pouring a most destructive, demoralizing, enfilading fire of double canister into a confused mass of the enemy struggling in the uncertain shadows of the crest of Cemetery Hill. Well, if they're struggling in these uncertain shadows of the crest, Whittier is telling us that they have punched holes into the Union line. Confederate soldiers have moved through. They are streaming uphill. They are no longer shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder battle lines, but they have gathered in groups, maybe 10, 20, 30, and they're going to try to rush up this hill as quickly as they can. So turn around for a second here. We can see some of the guns and some of the monuments. Now we would not have this low shrub brush that we have today. Animals would have eaten that. But this terrain is going to be a challenge. You are carrying 30 pounds of gear, absolute minimum. You are in a wool uniform. There is smoke in the air. It is humid. It is noisy. It is confusing. There are flashes of light, flashes of these hails of death. And still the soldiers are pressing on, trying to get up to those guns. And we know that some groups of Confederate soldiers are going to make it up there, and they are going to challenge Captain Ricketts' orders to stay there and not give up the guns. If you follow me, we're going to move back up the hill and learn the story of what happens to these guns on the top of Cemetery Hill. So the 11th Corps again was commanded by General Oliver Otis Howard, and the symbol of the 11th Corps is that crescent moon. 
So especially on the monuments here, you're going to see a crescent moon telling us that that unit was a part of the 11th Corps. So it would have been on their flag? It would have been on their flag as well. Now they would have carried state flags and federal flags and that at a brigade or division level there would have been a flag to identify that brigade or division and it would have had the emblem. Uh, for example, General Hancock commands the second corps and the second corps emblem is the trefoil or three-leaf clover. Uh, the first corps is the circle. The uh, fifth corps is going to be the Maltese cross. Think four triangles inverted to the center. Sixth corps is going to be the Greek cross. Think of a tic-tac-toe board missing the four corners. Uh, and then the twelfth corps is going to be the star. So in the Union Army, each corps has an emblem, and we see those emblems here in their monumentation as well. So those emblems are a, a marker of pride and esprit de corps. Same thing as for these soldiers, there's pride in making sure that these cannons don't fall. They're going to be heavily tested along this entire line. First, at Weedrick's Battery. Weedrick's Battery is this next battery down on the north side of the wall. So the first two guns, as we mentioned earlier, are part of Ricketts Battery, then the next one is Weedrick's. A Confederate soldier rushes to one of these guns and he claims the gun in the name of the Confederacy. A soldier who is standing on the back left of that gun. That's the number four position. Number four holds a four foot piece of string and he responds to this Confederate soldier. Du soll sie haben! And he yanks that string. Anybody know what du soll sie haben means? No, it translates into, you shall have it. <laughs> now, this Union artillerist is referring to the contents of the gun, not the physical possession of the gun, as the Confederate soldier had claimed. And that tells us that Confederate soldiers are in the guns. They are up close. They have broken through the infantry support, at least at some point. Seizing sponge staffs, rammers, and rocks from the adjacent wall, we now repulsed the thoroughly disheartened tigers, Weedrick wrote. Ricketts, four guns here, two guns on the other side of the wall. The boys fought them hand to hand with pistols, hand spikes, and rammers. The left half of the battery was engaged in a hand to hand fight with the rebels who had leaped the stone wall the one that you're sitting on right now. The fire was kept up by the right half, the four guns over here. So again, we have a hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Confederate soldiers in groups, tens, twenties, have gotten to the crest of this hill and are trying to capture these pieces of artillery. The Union artillerists, again, have been told never to retreat. They have to hold this ground. Lieutenant Brockway, of Ricketts Battery is going to give us what I find to be the most fascinating story of the fighting here on Cemetery Hill. A rebel first lieutenant attempted to seize our battery guide on. So a second ago we talked about the symbols on the monuments. The battery guide on is that flag that identifies the battery. But while in act of grasping it, the bearer rode up and shot the Confederate officer. Seizing the colors, he wielded his horse, but at the same moment was shot himself and died soon thereafter. A sergeant of the Tigers, Confederate soldiers from Louisiana had been nicknamed the Tigers. This was originally Wheat's Battalion, called the Louisiana Tigers. A sergeant of the Tigers got clear back to the limbers. So he's at least 14 yards behind the guns to the next set of vehicles. When he was encountered by Sergeant Stratford, who demanded to know where he was going with that horse. <laughs> Horses are very important to the artillery. That's what helped move the guns. The soldiers in the artillery do not get to ride the horses. They walk alongside. 
So he is very disconcerted to see somebody taking this horse away. The rebel brought his musket to his shoulder and demanded Stratford surrender. At this moment, I walked up and a glance showed me the true state of affairs. Having no sidearms by me, I picked up a stone and in the most unmilitary manner, broke it over the fellow's head. He tumbled to the ground, but Stratford, not knowing the cause, seized his musket and shot him through the abdomen. There is a great deal of confusion. Any implement of the artillery is becoming a weapon. Rocks are becoming weapons. For these Confederate soldiers that have made it to this top of the hill, if they're looking back, the casualties are behind them, but no one else. There are no reserves coming. For the Union Army, there are very few reserves, but there is a little bit of help coming, a few regiments. Most everybody else had already been sent to the opposite end of the battlefield earlier in the day. But a couple of key units will come forward and provide some assistance. Then the Confederate attack will be pushed out from amongst the guns back down this hill. The fighting here on the night of July 2nd will end. The Confederate soldiers reach this area, though they can test for the guns, they cannot take or hold, so they fall back. On July 3rd, Cemetery Hill is going to continue to figure prominently in the battle. Lee writes that the general plan is unchanged. He had hoped to continue his attacks on each end of the line, one end being over at Culp's Hill. Culp's Hill might even be an approach to Cemetery Hill. There will be fighting at Culp's Hill from 4.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m., six hours of sustained fighting. The Confederate soldiers cannot take that part of the line. And because that fighting starts very early in the day, it disrupts part of Lee's plan. He has to make a couple of minor adjustments and he will launch what becomes known as Pickett's Charge. Prior to that charge, 150 pieces of Confederate artillery will fire against the center of the Union line, which is held by 30 pieces of artillery. But 30 of these guns here on Cemetery Hill turn to the west and they begin responding. There are 40 additional guns further to the south, a total of 100 Union guns in defense. When that charge goes forward, the guns on Cemetery Hill sight the far left end of the line of Pickett's Charge, a unit called Brock and Brow's Brigade. It's a brigade of Virginians. They take so much artillery fire from other guns on Cemetery Hill, but on the opposite side of the Baltimore Pike, that that Confederate brigade falls out of Pickett's Charge. The leftmost brigade is beaten back by artillery. That is going to allow Union units and General Hancock's 2nd Corps to sweep and attack the left flank of Pickett's Charge. Pickett's Charge, which is supposed to strike the center of the Union line, is itself going to be enveloped from both sides by infantry and artillery. And that last Confederate attack on July 3rd finds that it is no more successful than the one that took place here on the night of July 2nd. Cemetery Hill is going to be the key point on the field July 1st, July 2nd, and July 3rd. A number of soldiers wearing both blue and gray look at the field that way including General Buford, General Reynolds, General Howard, General Hancock on the Union side, General Ewell, General Lee on the Confederate side. And so as David Wills, who lives here in the town of Gettysburg, as he learns about this battle days afterwards, he will write to the governor of Pennsylvania from this most important point on the field, 
During Thursday and Friday of the battle, our artillery dealt death and destruction to the rebel army in every direction of its advance. In his mind, holding this ground won the battle. And so when it comes time to honor those Union soldiers who have fallen on this battlefield, he is going to buy up property on Cemetery Hill. Again, if you will, please turn to your right. Looking over the terrain, we can see some of the graves there in the Soldiers National Cemetery. You may even be able to see the gates on the Baltimore Pike. From this position, we can see the graves both of those who died here at Gettysburg as well as veterans of the United States who have served in war since that time. Today, Cemetery Hill continues to be an important point on the field, both for understanding what happened here and for memorializing those who gave all for their country. Thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. I'll be happy to take some questions. Uh, a couple other things quick. Uh, please help me thank Matt Hoosh, who is here filming these programs. You can see these programs. These are for the American public. We are putting these up on our YouTube channel. So you can get online and you can watch a Ranger program from various parts of the battlefield, wherever you're at. Unfortunately, it's still second to actually being on the terrain and getting to see it yourself. But this is another way in which you can learn about the Battle of Gettysburg. So we are on YouTube. We are also on Facebook as well. I would encourage you uh, to like us on Facebook. You want to look for Gettysburg National Military Park. And you have to use all four words because there are about 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 different groups that have Gettysburg in their title. So look for Gettysburg National Military Park. Uh, we try to put up new content every day on Facebook, and we're rolling out uh, new films uh, through YouTube. So you have a great opportunity to be a part of what is happening at the park from where you're at. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. For the cannons, how many men did it take to work a cannon then? Great question. Uh, a cannon crew is going to take a total of 10 soldiers. We're going to have six soldiers right at the gun, operating it in battle. We're going to have two soldiers at the next vehicle, which is the limber. And we're going to have two more soldiers at the third vehicle, which is going to be the caisson. So you're going to have three different vehicles. They're going to be spaced at 0, 14, and 28 yards from the front. So there's six guys to make that gun actually work day in and day out during the battle. It's very heavy on logistics. Any other questions? Yeah. Going back to when General Lee told General Yule to take this hill if applicable or practical. Practicable, yeah. Say General Jackson was still here at the time. And he told General Jackson to take this hill if applicable. Being that they were of one mind, do you think General Jackson would have taken this hill or died trying? Well, I, I, I would disagree that Lee and Jackson are of one mind. Uh, when we look at Jackson's career, we often focus on the part of his career looking at the Valley Campaign or looking, say, at Second Manassas, uh, Antietam, and Chancellorsville especially. Uh, we don't look necessarily at Jackson's performance in the Seven Days Campaign around Richmond, uh, where there are some challenges in that communication. And I bring that up just to say that uh, Jackson's not perfect and he has his challenges. So I don't think we can always assume that if Jackson's here, something specific would follow. There is a big difference between Ewell and Jackson in terms of how they think. Uh, because Ewell has been under Jackson, he is used to getting very specific orders that don't have discretion. Lee is giving him a level of a discretion that Jackson never did. And in doing so, I think Lee has failed to really understand what that adaptation is. 
We have no idea what the Army of Northern Virginia is going to look like if Jackson is here instead of Ewell. Uh, I think it would have been very different. First of all, we don't know if there would be still two core or three core. Uh, you know, that change, that changes a lot in terms of how the Army is organized, who's the lead element, where divisions are marching at. Um, Jackson tended to be very decisive. So there is a possibility that his interpretation of if practicable is do it. He may take a different interpretation. I think that's what Lee meant when he told him that, told you that thinking that, well, this is what Jackson would have done if I would have told him that. I, I don't think that's what Lee means at all because Lee doesn't tell him directly to take it. Lee gives him that element of discernment. And when Lee writes his official report, he takes those reasons that come back from Ewell and says, we weren't able to do it for these reasons. He accepts the decisions that Ewell made instead of, you know, correcting Ewell on that. So I, I, I don't think that it's very clear. I don't think that it is an obvious decision for Ewell. Uh, Lee's leaving him a lot of discretion. And, you know, when Lee writes that official report, he does not, he doesn't censure or reprimand Ewell at all for the way in which he makes the decision. It's a good question, though. Are there any others? Okay. Well, enjoy your visit to Gettysburg, and uh, I want to invite you to attend as many Ranger programs as you can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great job. Thank you.